espontaneamente, sem debatedor, fui convidado. Eu tive ali também liberdade de convidar um amigo, um amigo certo das horas incertas, Luiz Carlos Gonçalves, para compor a mesa e iniciar, então, o um comentário desse, debater esse, esse assunto. A gente vai tentar fazer um debate, um, um comentário mais sucinto, tá, Luiz Carlos? está um pouquinho atrasado, e no final a gente vai abrir para a plateia um debate geral. Obrigado, Sérgio. É, eu não sei, acho que o Marcelo não está aqui, mas me surpreende é, que alguns trabalhos, o Marcelo é um dos que já apresentou isso algumas vezes, e ele é muito empolgado com a questão da, da durabilidade, da, do tempo em que os existentes é, ficam permeáveis. E é um defensor dessa história. Eu não tenho uma casuística muito grande, mas eu sou de uma cidade pequena, a gente acompanha também muito esses pacientes e a impressão é que é, a ideia do, da de perverdade é um pouco maior. Mas agora me surpreende que a gente está precisando de lançar mão de mais dois, dois produtos para o tratamento. Né? E parece que esses produtos também não acrescentam muito, muito benefício, a diferença é relativamente pequena. Além do que, os estentes ainda são curtos para cobrir áreas maiores, e a gente sabe que na artéria femoral, muitas vezes, a cobertura de 5 centímetros não é tão frequente. É, a questão é, é o seguinte, nós realmente é, podemos confiar pouco na angioplastia do território femoral, principalmente em áreas mais extensas. Nós devemos estar preparados para, dentro de um ano, dois anos, substituir ou complementar nosso tratamento, porque... Essa é a ideia que a gente está, de repente, começando a formar. Tá. É, muito obrigado. Bom, vamos dar sequência, vou passar a palavra para o Júlio Peclá. É, gostaríamos de convidar o professor Christian Bianchi para nos falar uh, sobre o uso periférico da endoprótese via pão. Thank you again for the invitation. This is the last one for me. Um, again, I appreciate the gratitude for, for everything here in Brazil. Uh, I'll talk about peripheral experience with the Gore Vibon in just case, as I was requested a couple of cases to show the device in non-occlusive disease patients. Seems to be a uh, disclosure. My travel expenses have been covered by Gore. Uh, the description has been already presented to you yesterday. It's an ultra-thin EPTFE tube, has uh, contour proximal edges, uh, bioactive surface with heparin bonded, um, and it's a nitinol exoskeleton, uh, uh, cover skeleton. The diameters and lengths are here in this slide. Uh, has a highly, flexi highly flexible device, excellent trackability, has an excellent patency for popliteal aneurysms, and uh, certainly compares to EPTFE bypass in the occlusive disease of femoral popliteals. The hammers and lengths are uh, described here, profiling from 6 to uh, 12 French size. First case is a 62-year-old with an incidental finding of an asymptomatic left subclavian saccular aneurysm arising from a right-sided arch. Uh, as you know, right-sided arch are rare. Uh, the type of this particular patient was type 2. And uh, you see here the aberrant uh, subclavian there with a significant aneurysmal degeneration. True with actually a proximal neck and a distal neck of 8 millimeters distally and uh, 7 millimeters proximally. You see the whole aneurysm there. So in the preoperative planning phase, you know, you want to take into consideration the left arterial system, which in this case was occluded. There was no uh, lima graft coming, arising from the, the subclavian artery. The proximal measures of the subclavians were 7 millimeters. Uh, the distal subclavian diameter was 8 millimeters. Uh, intraoperative wise, uh, we perform a brachiofemoral approach, determine the treatment length, and as a plan B, if we were not able to achieve sealing, uh, we were going to cover the subclavian artery with a thoracic tank device. And this is uh, the angiogram showing the left subclavian retrograde and uh, via the brachial, at the same time a pigtail in the ascending aorta. Uh, this, the different views to open the right sided arch and um, the estimated treatment length was about 15 centimeters. Uh, the viabon via the brachial was an 8 by uh, 10 centimeters, and then a proximal viabon via the femoral approach after selectively catheterizing the origin uh, was an 8 millimeter by 10 as well, an overlapping of 5 centimeters. Uh, this was uh, ballooned, 
uh, and this is the follow-up uh, study that shows a patent stand with an excluded aneurysm. So it goes very, very slow here. And that's the 24-month follow-up. He's due to the 36 a month in April. Uh, this was the first report of endovascular exclusion of a true left subclavian sacular aneurysm arising from the right-sided uh, arch. A second case is a 49-year-old man presented with upper abdominal pain. It's a history of laparoscopic astectomy for symptomatic right upper quadrant pain and GI bleed and a prior MI, very young patient. Had a common hepatic aneurysm involving the hepatic arterial bifurcation, which was deemed not a candidate for endovascular therapy. <coughs> As you can see here in the 3D reconstruction, there's really no distal sealing zone. The first operation uh, was actually aborted due to a cardiac event. He went into um, uh, asystole. Um, he was actually resuscitated, a cardiology uh, or console was obtained, the cath was delivered a couple of days afterwards, and it was a diagnosis of uh, Prince Metal Angina. Uh, he stabilized from that, and then a second operation was attempted. The, uh, a bypass to the left hepatic artery uh, was performed and then again sustained a cardiac event. Uh, the graft thrombose and the patient was uh, returned to the operating room in pretty bad condition uh, with the left lobe of the liver and pretty dusky. Uh, the post complication was actually um, by fever and necrotic left liver. It was drained by the IR and in about 15 days later on, on New Year's Eve actually, uh, a significant hemorrhage for the drain starts coming out and patient became shocky. Emergently was taken back to the operating room and our differential diagnosis was hemobilia versus rupture aneurysm. Uh, our preoperative planning was uh, you know, facilitated by the prior CT scans that we had and we knew they had a hepatic artery of about eight millimeters in diameter approximately and the right hepatic, which is the only hepatic artery now that he had, was four millimeters in diameter prior to operations in the past. So what we thought an uh, endovascular approach uh, was probably the way to go for this patient. Um, we selectively catheterized via the brachial approach, the celiac artery with an eight, uh, nine French uh, profile sheath, uh, perform an angiogram that essentially ruled out hemobilia. Uh, you see some blushing of the hepatic aneurysm there. Uh, establish the treatment length, about 150 millimeters, and uh, go ahead and uh, track at Viabon. Start a five by five, uh, five by five distally, and a seven by ten uh, uh, approximately, and then a nine by five for diameter, uh, up as well opposition, uh, more proximally to that. And this is the excluded uh, aneurysm there. Patient uh, did okay, and uh, he's uh, currently a year out with a patent uh, uh, reconstruction. Uh, the patients uh, uh, receive. Uh, Plavix and aspirin for one month after the case. And there's the two year being uh, patent. Uh, a third option for Viabons, uh, uh, we publish uh, the, the axillary vein being uh, a good outflow for patients with arteriovenous uh, <coughs> problems. Uh, and, and this is something that we start to encounter after we perform these procedures that the axillary vein is compromised and then the subclavian vein could potentially be the next target to, to maintain access to, for dialysis. In this particular case, you see a patient with a significant stenosis of the subclavian. And we address uh, retrograde and we balloon and then that becomes a target for an anastomosis. And what we uh, start using is something that it will be soon approved here in this country, but you can still do uh, by suturing a Viabon stent graft to your PTFT graft when there's, again, no other options to facilitate the distal anastomosis or the venous anastomosis and be that a sutureless anastomosis, minimizing the exposure and, and maybe taking advantage of, of, of an arm that uh, otherwise would have been left behind and start the access on the other arm. Uh, and this is the typical exposure. We do a brachial uh, artery for the arterial side and then the subclavian approach. And um, we tunnel through, and uh, this is kind of the key. The Viabon is introduced either over the wire or through a, a, a sheath system, if you may. And then uh, you can suture that uh, Viabon to a EPTFE graft and then creating your hybrid uh, procedure yourself. And that's kind of how, how they end up looking. And this is how the patients after the operation. So in summary, these uh, three cases illustrate the accuracy and flexibility and the ease of use of this particular stent in, in different uh, clinical situations. Thank you very much.